we have to stream it here. All right. We're up. Yeah, it's live. All right. All right. I got my notes here. All right. So, we both in. Getting extra cozy. All right. Um, Welcome uh, to Pastry Leaks' first live stream. We're here in St. Louis. Uh, have the privilege to have been in the kitchen with Chef Nathaniel Reed for the last couple days. Um, local Missouri man. Uh, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've run circles a little bit. Yep. Absolutely. Have some mutual friends. Sure. Um, so. I mean, there's, we've had a lot of conversations over the last couple of days yeah. and so many stories to go on. And, you know, one of the first things that I've always uh, seen within your work, you do really clean, precise work. You've, you've done competitions. You've gotten to work with a lot of incredible people. Right. Um, I'm curious, how, how has competitions helped you in opening up your own shop? Um, I think, you know, competitions, it's about being competitive, mm -hmm. and it's not always about competing with everyone. I feel like it's more about being in competition with yourself and pushing yourself and motivating mm -hmm. yourself, um, trying to be the best you can be and make mm -hmm. the best product you can be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that applies to everyday life and goes into everyday life and also running your business, you know. Mm -hmm. There's not a gold medal or a medal handed out every day in opening a business, but it's definitely um, to be better, mm -hmm. to everyday take the challenge to meet the customer's expectations yeah. and uh, really push yourself and drive yourself. Um, I think that's the overall scheme of it, what I think came out of being in competitions. Um, discipline from that, uh, you know, the hard work and dedication it puts into going into a competition mm -hmm. is also really relevant into what it takes to open your own business and mm -hmm. put in the long hours, put in the time um, with no guarantee of a result. You yeah, know, there's no guarantee you're going to be on the podium or make you know get a medal or do anything, and there's no <laughs> guarantee your of your business to be successful. But you're putting yeah. in the, the trust that your hard work is going to be pay off, and, mm -hmm. and the process is part of the payoff. You know, right. the the journey is part of the payoff, not just the destination. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like as we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, one of the things that I had mentioned is whether you're successful in any way. You, the people who are successful are the ones who are willing to do what other people aren't. Yep. You know, you, you're the one who's putting in the extra hours, whether it's for a competition or being a business owner, it's being, uh, not being seen for the things that you do. It's the only yeah. person who's gonna recognize those things are, uh, like, it's yourself, mm -hmm. it's for self gratification. You know, the customer might, uh, like you hope a customer appreciates something, but there's also a sense of self-satisfaction that you have to have by being able to provide some sort of different experience to a customer. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm curious, like what do you bring into the shop like on an everyday basis? You know, like how, um, how do you bring that mentality in? Yeah, I mean, I think you always, mm -hmm. you know, you should, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if somebody's watching or not. Mm -hmm. You know, your standards are your standards. How you work is your work. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a viewership or you don't have to do, you know, have somebody watching. It's like, how do you work when no one's watching? That's right. what's important. And uh, always maintaining the highest standards and, you know, from the, from the acquisition of your of your ingredients or purchasing your ingredients to the techniques you use um, to how the product is handled throughout the, the environment mm -hmm. and having the guest service for the guests. And for me personally, the guest service goes to their home and doesn't stop at the right. register. So Yeah, I mean it's doing all the little things, and that's what's hard to do. And to show up every day on a on a Monday that's maybe not as busy, and treat it with the same intensity and passion as you're going to treat the day before yeah. um, Christmas or the day before Easter or these big big moments that you know are going to be intense. And um, I always appreciated that and appreciate the, the the grind of the day to make it always searching in that quest for excellence and. Uh, yeah standards and not wavering on them no matter the situation finding out how we can make those our standards be met no matter what happens mm -hmm. in the day or in the 
environment I'm working in, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant or yeah. a chocolate shop or my own bakery. Mm -hmm. Like, as that's something that you have to obviously develop. I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of drive as like a young pastry cook once you've got that passion, but someone has to be able to instill a lot of those things in. It's the repetition. Did you, like, who did you feel like was that yeah. guy who was pushing you? Yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel yeah. like it was me. Yeah. You know, just who I am is that way, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of it. Um, I would say that the place I felt had uh, a biggest impact on my career was working for Joel Obershawn and mm -hmm. um, I was a sous chef there and I opened up the three Michelin star restaurant mm -hmm. and the one Michelin star restaurant in the A. Um, but just to see the, the level of discipline, the level of uh, standards and organizations and that constant pursuit for perfection mm -hmm. um, was definitely like uh, going and thriving in an environment I felt like I was yeah. Uh, meant to be in, and a lot of the lessons and the uh, ways of working are, you know, are still in what I do on the day-to-day -day basis here, you know, the, what was instilled in me there is for sure carried out throughout my career, and um, I mean, there's a reason he's become what, or became what he was, and was a living legend, and you know, you, you had to do, like yeah. what you said, <laughs> do the things other people aren't willing to do, and go the extra mile, and, mm -hmm. and all those things, and and uh, I mean, definitely known for all those things. Yeah, so I was hoping to hear a little bit, you know, at your time at Robichon, mm -hmm. you know, you're obviously known for your pound cakes. Sure. You've been doing them for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and you've kind of innovated in, in a lot of ways there. Uh, but that story that you told me yesterday yeah. in the kitchen, like, would you mind sharing, share sharing a little bit of that? Right, so, well, that was me. I mean, probably at that time, I think I started, when I started Robichon, I was 24 or something like that, 23, 24, and probably about that time, I'm 25 or 26, and um, Mr. Robichon was coming into town for a visit, and um, the executive pastry chef at the time uh, just made these uh, lemon pound cakes, which I changed some things and did some, like, you know, very interesting things to it to really make this amazing texture and bright, lemony flavors, and it was I felt really well done, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, apparently my chef also felt it was really done, and when Mr. Robichon was coming to town, they asked me to, to present Mr. Robichon with this cake, um, which is a big, you know, at the time, and being 25 years old, that's a pretty cool opportunity to, you know, basically serve Robichon something you've made, mm -hmm. and um, I gave it to him and his, his team that he traveled with, and uh, it was like a, it was a big pound cake, like a kilo and a half pound cake, it was huge. And uh, you know he ate it all in like 15 minutes or something, yeah. like him and his team, and they loved it. And uh, they asked for another one, and I luckily made an extra one any, anyways because it's just the recipe. And mm -hmm. so I finished it and gave it to him again, and they ate it again, and they asked for more for the next day. And uh, it was, I feel like, you know, it's a small, maybe it's not so small, but it's kind of a, a mistake for me mm -hmm. at the time, especially, and and still is now to think, you know, I. He's not uh, one to give out a lot of good comments, and he loved mm -hmm. it. And um, if he gave you a positive comment about the about food, yeah, it was for sure earned and deserved, you know. And it was That's a really true. neat thing to have that appreciation and for him to have that uh, those uh, kind words to say about something is maybe a little in the culinary world as a lemon pound cake, yeah. no matter how good it is. But um, and then he had asked, you know, had. Uh, really liked it enough to, to get the recipe for it from me and not directly but to ask the team yeah. to ask me for the <laughs> recipe and then and the method and everything and then they used it as their giveaway for a lot of the his restaurants all around the world mm -hmm. so like as a parting gift when you left his restaurants was yeah. the cake I developed for work, when I was working for him and everything and you know it's one of those little it's not a medal on the wall but it's one of my own personal yeah. things that you know still resonates with me today um, and you know, it's amazing. This guy is one of the best talents of one of the chefs of the century and all that. And <clears throat> that belief of taking something that's uh, almost uh, everyday kind of item like a lemon pound cake and taking great ingredients, but taking the best idea and I changed, I have a very creative way I made the, make the pound cakes and right. do them. And um, it makes the texture different and all these things. And doing it with the, uh, 
interesting type of technique in, in treating the ingredients with respect and everything to make something that's a daily item become uh, out of this world and become so extraordinary. And that's something I really love to do all the time and love to right. do in my bakery, love to do just in cooking is how can how can I make a strawberry jam now, the best strawberry jam somebody's ever tasted mm -hmm. and like work on it and obsess about it and think about how can with all the techniques, with all the ingredients, with everything through the process and then how it's handled, how can I make this an experience? It's something that's an everyday kind of occurrence, but how can we make it to get people to go, I've, I've never had jam like that in my life. And those kind of moments are, I think, more prideful than I created a cake and it's interesting, no one's ever seen this decoration before, no one's maybe had this combination. But to say that you have something better than you've ever had it, like, and it's a common, ordinary type of item, mm -hmm. or an everyday, and they have a frame of reference to compare it to, is to me is monumental. Mm -hmm. And that's really those moments drive me every day, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and when you, on lemons, you, you mentioned some of the <laughs> things that you got to do. You, you sure know, you, you've obviously competed a lot, but you, you mentioned earlier, it was like, you did this bonbon. Right. And, and you went through, you talked to your purveyor, you got the mm. best case of lemons that you can get. Sure. But it, <clears throat> you still have to go above and beyond, especially yeah. when you're competing. Right. You're going through, yeah. you pick the top yeah. lemons. So, yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> I was doing the U.S. pastry competition. Okay. And this, uh, other people probably aren't thinking ever to do or, mm -hmm. you know, going to do. and. I, it's funny, I talked to Tom about the story about when I did uh, the bon bon uh, for the U.S. pastry competition. Um, it had a lemon ganache inside of the bonbon bon and I acquired a great case of lemons. And then besides that, to use the zest and the juice in the recipe, I took every lemon in the whole case and I zested each a little strip of zest from every lemon and smelt it for the right to take the best ones and I sorted them out and I took the be very best 10 by by the zest and the fragrance and set those aside to use in the recipe and then I cut every lemon in the case in half or every lemon in half yeah. and tried the juice from every lemon in the case to find the best 10 that I needed for the recipe as well mm -hmm. and used those best 10 and the juice and the best 10 of the lemons because not every right. lemon or every thing in the case is created equal, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about searching out, finding the best, and really going that next step of how can I do this the best way possible. It sounds crazy. Yeah. It no, is. It is. <laughs> we, well, we are crazy in, in that yeah. way. We're, we obsess yeah. over the details as a pastry chef, mm -hmm. and, and that boils down to taste. Right. You know, you, you talked heavily about like flavor profiles, how you build the recipe. It, it comes down to taste. Mm -hmm. you know, how and then how do you go about building things around that? You talk about difference in different um, texturizers or how you're going right. to gel something. That could be gelatin. That could be cornstarch. Mm -hmm. That could be pectin. It you have to pull all of those things together. Right. And it's really interesting to have walked into the kitchen and seen mm -hmm. how you hold that together and how you yeah. train other people to do that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I'm not the one making all the items. I'm going to have a team of 30 people mm -hmm. that work here. And, um, you know, I have mm -hmm. my job as the chef, but also as the owner and, mm -hmm. and everything for the company. And it's not my, uh, I, I'm the chef to train everybody to make sure that the quality of the food is the right quality and, mm -hmm. and hopefully as close as to what I can make it as possible. And I definitely put in everything in the place that's possible. I measure everything that's measurable, um, the time, the temperature, the size, the everything, and it's formulated. So it's going to be as accurate as possible, you know. Um, everything's all the small items are scaled with micro scales from the colorants to the pectins and yeah, thickeners and jelly agents and things like that. Um, but really, it's like a lot of the controls in place, but how it starts out is the opposite, you know, like really kind of the opposite. So like um, a lot of the product is how I make it is I have, I have a, someone will gather all the ingredients that we need or that I'm looking at and some are used, some aren't, but mm -hmm. it's about how I want to start the product. They scale out the container of what's all in the product, and you know, with every product, and write down the, the weight, and then I'll just 
take them without scaling them and blend everything together to get the taste and texture and everything I want. And then the difference of what went into the recipe and what's remaining in the product is then, or in the, each individual product is then weighed out and then that becomes the recipe. So there's no kind of influence about outside things like, oh, this is 7.54 grams and like it should be 10, you know, or yeah. it should be a round kind of clear number when in fact I tasted it. I made it, I know 7.54 is what it should be. And then building the pastry ingredients more in the way a savory chef would, but then having the controls of a pastry chef for the production and for the consistency is kind of how it all works. And it's, you know, it's fun because you're really creating and you're really making things and you're really thinking about taste first. Right. And it's just a fun, fun way to do things, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. The when it comes down to you know being able to put those systems in place, mm -hmm. do you have a, like, what's your methodology for you know this is a problem, this is how we can go about fixing it, how do we mm -hmm. troubleshoot it, how do we you know put those barriers in place so we are not running into any issues along the way? Yeah, and, well, there's a lot of systems, and yeah, I mean it's um, it's a small bakery but with a lot of moving parts and a lot of people, and um, you know there's. I, Definitely, besides just the cooking part, there's overall systems so that things don't fall through the cracks and things are consistent and streamlined and hopefully uh, seamless for the guests. You know, they don't know how, how I, I want them to feel like it's effortless and that they just can come in and have these luxury products and it's effortless for them, great service. They don't need to know how hard it can be at times and how right. things can happen and life happens and things can break and all that stuff their issue, you know, it's my yeah. issue to, to, to deal with and to take care of, but mm -hmm. um, really invest heavily in training and training on this, the team and the staff and, um, you know, and putting into place, taking the time to, to put all these details together so that it is consistent and it always will be as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then training the service staff on the same things on all the best, you know, there's a lot of best practices that should always be in place. And then mm -hmm. there's best practices for, you know, the bakery, you know, and some of the things that you might do somewhere else, maybe don't apply to this environment. And I think that's interesting too, is, you know, to bring your own systems and things into place about what your customer demands and what your customer needs and, you know, needs. And right. Things. So it's kind of like, I heard somebody tell me one time that on the different business, they said there's the right way, the wrong way, and then, like, say, the Nathaniel Reed Bakery Sure. Way, right? And I thought, as funny as that is, it's kind of true, you know, there's, there's, you have to come up with what's the way that's the best practice for your business and for your customers and for your space and your facility, your equipment and those types of things. So it is a challenge and it changes throughout the year and throughout everything and you have to be able to be... Uh, uh, open enough to to adapt to what those changes are and not be full headed to stay in your zone. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you you also described like the, the customer experience. You know, you're you're in St. St. Louis. You're doing a lot of European style products. Mm -hmm. You have the petit gâteau. You have um, the anniversary items and mm -hmm. French macarons. And that's something that a lot of people in the U.S. aren't necessarily like accustomed to. Like, how have you adapted what you've done at Robichon and, and some of the other places that you've worked in, and how you've worked in competition? How have you like adapted that to the community yeah. that you've been into? Yeah, that's, that's a big question. Yeah. A good question. Uh, I, you know, I at first I was a little hesitant to maybe go all the way in and do some of the things. Should I rename things? Should I call the Queen of Monarch Queen of Monarch? Should I name it a salted caramel croissant? You know, how's the, what's the reception going to be to this kind of product and to it? And it's not really like something else really existed in this market space that, with that kind of selection and things. So it was a leap of blind faith. I said, if I'm going to do this, let's jump in all the way. Let's find out what the reaction is. And it's great. You know, we, they, there's all the, for the most part, all the names are the names they should be and like these kinds of things. And it's kind of funny and interesting to people say, I'll take the, 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 the K one or the whatever. And we all, yeah. everybody already knows what we're pointing at and some people say it or not. But 
it's definitely not a play that we're not judging people like if they can pronounce something if they know what it is or not you know it's about we we're all human we all enjoy food we all have this affinity for, for good food and want to have that and that's the commonality of everyone and everybody comes to the doors and thinking everybody works here so i'm not trying to sit here and try to educate and tell you why you only have to pronounce it like this or this is the name or this is appreciate it for this. No, you like it or you, you don't like yeah. it. And I, I'm very fortunate that they came out of the door. And uh, we're going to take great customer service, take great care of them while they're here, and mm -hmm. treat them like family when they come in the door. And it's uh, definitely, a, I feel like we created an environment that's not exclusive by, yeah. by any means. It's really like um, everybody feels pretty welcome here, like it sounds like all life will come mm -hmm. in. And, pretty neat to see that and I'm very very, very happy for that and to see like you know like I was telling you a story we have yeah. uh, some uh, mechanics that are down the plaza from us and they're coming in and they're they're like oiled up you know outfits on and stuff mm -hmm. and ordering these things picking out these arguing amongst each other yeah. about which little <laughs> dainty petite gets so they're going to eat that day and stuff yeah. and you like thinking about it it's kind of funny it's comical in a way but it's just so cool you know mm -hmm. like that that would happen and it's neat when you see, you know, people come in, there's little kids, and these kids press their face up against the glass to see the macaroons, and I explained to Tom earlier, it's like, I want, this is a long approach for me, it's a marathon, and it's business for me to keep investing in, investing in the community. I can't wait to see those people come back in 20, 30 years, those young ladies and gentlemen, with their kids someday, and right. their kids doing the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's that relationship with the community, that relationship with our customers, that's just so fortunate to have that yeah. mm -hmm. to be in this special place in St. Louis and, and do it and um, the people really appreciate the food we're doing here and right. have grown to see new things I've never imagined seeing or eating and uh, it's part of, it's cool to be a part of that and that momentum went with it. Mm -hmm. and it's great to see the community receive it as well as it has oh yeah, yeah. you know the being here in the building and being up front and walking, seeing everyone walk in and seeing the diversity of clientele and to see someone who is able to appreciate all the different items that are actually in the case because like, to me it's like there's a lot of, uh, it can be seen as stuffy if you present it in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's about the environment. It's, it's yeah. about the environment that you create and the service that you're able to deliver it in, and that's what makes the difference between something resonating with someone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, so mm -hmm. so this, I mean, the same case could be in some place that's, uh, you know, like I've done before in a five-star hotel, or it can be some of the products in a little very exclusive type of restaurant and things like that, but it's not, and it's in this casual uh, bakery, pastry shop bakery slash other savory things, but it's in this casual way where people can come in more in the old, old uh, community, local neighborhood bakery way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, have recognition, know our, know our us, get to know them, mm -hmm. and there's a simplicity of it. It's not a big dining space where they really are taking out the food, more of European style of bakery where they take right. things out to go with them and everything. And it's just fun, and they, you know, they get the trust from them on tasting the croissant. The next thing they're buying the chocolate on the croissant or right. banana the chocolate chip brioche, and then now they're like, buying the Queen Amon and some more different things are maybe a little bit more, um, say, risky, but like a little bit more unknown to this clientele and stuff, and it's neat to see that journey and see them, their excitement of trying all the different things. And, I mean, we, we talk about it, make everything here, like everything, every, every year, and like Tom's seen it when I say that, it's like we make our own almond paste, and we turn that into making the pan de gin to make for the cake that goes into the Polynesian cake to mm -hmm. all the, of course, nut butters and pickled vegetables, salad dressings, I mean, like, whatever, you know, puff pastry, all of it wants for you, of course, macarons, you know, jams, candy bars, you know, everything. So we have, like, just on a regular week, we have 150, 200 products that we're making every day. Right. And I think that that's hard for people to imagine that. How do you make everything that goes into everything and then also make all those different products from the snacks and cookies and the vinoiserie, 
the cakes and tarts and, and uh, the piquetto, salads, quiche, sandwiches, make all the bread and sandwiches in the house, and jams, rings, candy bars, confections. And it's a labor of love, you know? And, uh, I like to cook and I love to make things. I don't want to open box things. I can make it better than any manufacturer I've ever met, and I can make it for sure fresher than any manufacturer <laughs> I've met. And I get to, it's a local product in the end, and I get to uh, employ someone in the local community mm -hmm. instead of employing somebody abroad. You know? Right. And I think that that's part of being a business and, you know, our commitment to the community. And, you know, do other school business stuff. Like we Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, that's part of it. You know, that's part of the whole thing of being an owner and, and that neighborhood bakery. You know, in your community. The, like, as you've had people who, you know, come in, they're doing pastry work for you, or they're doing savory things and the savory side of things. Is there a general theme that you see as far as what people want as they come to the door, what they want to get out of working at the bakery? Yeah, I, well, I can tell you what I feel like they're, they're most appreciative of, like, in seeing it, that most of the people we hire have a lot of experience, or have a good amount of relative experience. And I think the biggest thing they enjoy is the difference in the culture of the place. And that it doesn't have, first of all, that it is challenging, you know, and I think people that like to cook and want to be good or be great deserve to be challenged and yeah. deserve in a good way mm -hmm. and deserve for someone to, to ask the best of them, just like they should ask for themselves. And I definitely do that. And they definitely do that as a team in a positive way to let's be the best we can. Let's hold each other accountable and let's come every day with that intensity to be successful and to, to make the best experience for the guests. So I think they're definitely um, impressed with that, the challenge, and that's a lot of why they come here to be better and to be challenged. They're impressed by how we make everything, and I think that's very eye-opening. Young kids are like, I didn't know you could make almond paste or pray <laughs> I thought that just came in that tub, and that's kind of embarrassing to hear that, but yeah, you know, but it's the truth of cooking in a lot of places around yeah. the world now. Um, but and then they're really enjoying seeing all these little things that we make and different things, and then um, I think they're impressed with the level of consistency and quality that you know we do a really good job of keeping things quality every day. And, doing whatever it takes to maintain that and the training and, and the program and just the culture of it. Um, one thing Tom got to witness is it's for sure it's a, a team environment Very much where everybody so. helps each other out and that includes front of the house and back of the house. So retail environment for the kitchen. So if there's a big line or there's more than the front of the house can handle at any time, um, the kitchen comes up and they've all been through front of the retail training uh, standards. and. They come and they help the guests just like if they were a barista that works here. And it's awesome to see that. And the customer yeah. appreciates that. It's, you know, a lot of times it's just for moments, five minutes or something like that, but to help to, to make the line go in the fashion it should be. But the cooks enjoy it. And the people working in the kitchen, they get to have that interaction with the community and with their customers. And most places don't get that. You know, if you're a cook, you really don't need any of the clients. No. You know, if you're uh, in a hotel, you have a BDO number, and that's what they're known by, not their name. You know, if you're in a restaurant, they're a table number, and that's how you know them. People pick you up. Here, it's, you know, Mr. Mr. Johnson, Miss whatever, and mm -hmm. things like that. And we, they get to meet them, and we have an open kitchen, an open window, a big window that opens to the kitchen and so it's kind of fun you see people waving at each other the cook and the, the community and the right. clients and so it's, it's neat so I think I just I think there's a lot of things you need I, I honestly believe that you know I've been a lot of places seen a lot of things and everybody has all different good things and this was for me a culmination of all the different experiences I've had different types of from small business to corporate business environments I've had and, and kind of extracting the best of all those practices I felt into putting it into to my own small business. Right. And, and that's a lot to put into a business too. Right. You know, there's a lot of things that go into the day to day and running all the operational details and keeping on top of everything. Um, you know, training being really important. What I guess what I'm getting down to, like when you work at the big hotels, mm -hmm. you know, there's a very clear line of, you know, person. There's the executive pastry chef. You've got all the sous. Right. You've got their.
uh, like for at the Ritz or the Credo card. Yeah. You know, you go over that every day at lineup. Yeah. Like, what are your things? Yeah. Like, what things are you like instilling into your cooks and your team so that they're right. able to live that in their day to day yeah. here at the shop? Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, like our basic fundamentals are yeah. clean, cleanliness, mm -hmm. organization, mm -hmm. professionalism. Um, you know, those are kind of the pillars for us to build off of the. Mm -hmm. The, the food, the food and beverage program, mm -hmm. um, and the service. Those are really the ideas of what we sell. We sell service and we sell food and beverage. You know, um, the next thing from that is keeping the consistency, and it's kind of a pyramid in a way that all that leads to being a, a guest experience. And right. that word can be used in a lot of ways, but I really believe that that's what it is. That you know, we have people driving for five mile, or five miles, five hours to come and buy a. a Three dollar croissant, uh -huh. you know, they're they're not coming just for a three dollar croissant. They're not investing all this time and the money into just that. You have to deliver this experience to them, mm -hmm. and that's what it's about. It's about coming into a place that you feel welcome, being there, genuinely and sincerely welcomed and appreciated about being there. That you're going to get a great, consistent service and a great quality product, you know, every time. And that's mm -hmm. really the delivery on the experience and really appreciating the customer. And I don't feel that that's always you know the case everywhere mm -hmm. of course but it's not really the environment right now you know and it's not the web the, it's not what's really the importancy I feel like in most businesses right now it's mm -hmm. more about you know if you call it like you call somebody to get service because your cable went up I mean it's a nightmare you know right. just all, almost places you try to get customer service from it's you know can you get the guy off of his cell phone long enough to, to help you make his lot make a lot thing you know that's not the standards here and that would be that those types of things and that's it's refreshing for people to have in somewhat of a way like that old ice cream parlor kind of right. service and local community kind of place and I think it's refreshing for a lot of people young and old to mm -hmm. see that and see that their their hard-earned dollars being spent here are very uh, appreciated they have a lot of mm -hmm. choices where they want to go and spend the money and there's a lot of bakeries in St. Louis and we're thankful they walk in here you know none of that happens so along the way we don't get to that guest experience without the commitment to the quality we don't get that without the the professionalism without the mm -hmm. without the organization without communication you know that's the other one that's kind of the, the foundation mm -hmm. none of that to me happens without those things so that in a way of talking about credo card or what your what your things I mean that's basically how we do it and it's mm -hmm. a lot of things that doesn't talk about food that much right doesn't talk about I'm a chef and I think that's another thing going back to your other question what impresses people to work here I don't always talk about being passionate about food and like doing all these crazy things with food we do that every day you know mm -hmm. that's part of cooking is loving you should already if you're gonna be working here you're already passionate about food and you should be self-motivated and love yeah. cooking um, we talk a lot about what it is to be a professional and what it is to be to be organized and clean and do all those things because that doesn't you don't go to the culinary school or you don't start cooking you're like I want to be organized always right mm -hmm. but if you want to be successful and you want to have those other tiers going up in the pyramid happening they have to happen you know right the great communication great organization cleanliness the professionalism and that the consistency otherwise why make good food if the environment's dirty you mm -hmm. know why great give great service if if uh, you can't get good communication about the order and the order gets messed up, you know. Right. But it, it's not things exclusive of, from each other, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Yeah, and, and I would have totally agree. I mean, everything builds on top of each other. The when I worked with Keegan Gearhart, you know, one of the things that he instilled in me, which we were talking about, I still do it at home. I have to fold all of my towels. Yeah. <laughs> that whether I'm in my kitchen or I'm at work, you know, you you end up w whatever is left on your counter. If you have a messy counter and you you're placing your plates on a messy counter, your plates are going to be messy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. every everything builds on top of each other. Yeah, messy countertop will eventually lead to messy plates. Right, and that all falls under organization. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes down to like communication and just working in general, like. I think it's great that we're able, to, or that you're able to be able to provide that for your team. But for someone who might not be in that environment, where they have the chef who's able to dictate some of those things and those mm -hmm. rules, what what could be something that 
mentioned like Jane mm -hmm. at a local bakery say, like, okay. in a different city what would she be able to do in order to mm -hmm. start pushing for herself a little bit more if she if she wants it but yeah. she doesn't have the exposure and place to do yeah. it yeah well you know, in it doesn't always have to come from a food environment you yeah. know there's I'm sure reading and things out there mm -hmm. ways to learn it but communication isn't just verbal I mean there's right. there's what kind of what kind of uh, uh, written material do you have? You know, what, do you have a training manual to bring people on board on? And mm -hmm. can you outsource that even if you just don't have the have the means to write it yourself or something? Who knows? Mm -hmm. what I mean, um, but I think starting from day one with the training manual and getting people properly on board is very helpful, and mm -hmm. that's a big thing. Corporations do write them on small mm -hmm. businesses. We don't always succeed in, um, you know, being very clear and and uh, consistent about what expectations are and mm -hmm. what the to me, it's very black and white about what's what's right and what's mm -hmm. on brand and what's not. You know, I think being consistent is a big part of that and just right. holding people accountable to it. Um, you know, and talk a lot. I think that sometimes you get, and a lot of chefs won't say that, like don't talk. Yeah. But you should always be talking and, and communicating. You know, there's things, with the way we work and the way we do things, I'm going to the dish bit to take something in there to the dish room. I see somebody else with something dirty, I'm going to ask them, I'm on my way. So it's like always trying to work is like uh, in this teamwork time frame where we're saving each other minutes and time throughout the day to build for that basket of goods. At the end of the day, we save hours, mm -hmm. you know, by working together as a team and using our voice um, to get through that. Or just having good paperwork and traceability things in, like that somebody puts an order in. How does that flow through your system and how does it get to mm -hmm. somewhere? Where it's not gonna, that it has a place, and that it's gonna go in, and that the order's not gonna get uh, missed or forgotten. Right. And then, so there's just having good, good structure, of paperwork, and um, uh, I think is really good. And mm -hmm. um, um, you know, see what works. Every environment's different. Just because something works here doesn't mean it's gonna work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The needs of here are different from the needs of a lot of places. But see what's. I would step back from your program and analyze. If, is there an opportunity somewhere? Is there a way we can do this better? If so, what's what's the uh, what's the approach to fix it? You know, do I need to have a, a, a staff meeting to talk about? Here's really the standards and our, our service standards, or, mm -hmm. or is it that I need to put out a, a memo, or it's a small place and I'm just working with somebody else or two other people, and I'm really in that environment where I can really coach and train on in the moment and on the day. That's really great opportunity if you have that mm -hmm. working side by side with somebody. You know, there's all these opportunities and. Training never stops. It's not like right here this hour we're training. It's you are working here. You are always training, mm -hmm. and I am always training. Or the trainers and the trainees, everybody's always learning and training and growing. Mm -hmm. So it's not you have this onboarding time, you have this time, but it just it the business is evolving, customer demands evolving, things change. And there's always got to be this time to train and grow the team and grow into the next phase of what they are and cross train and all these things. So it has to be. The time has to be allowed for it too, and I think sometimes the communication and training and stuff, we're like, okay, we're going to get through all this, and then we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to yeah. train about it after all this, and then we never get to that, you know. So you just have to just put your head down and do it, you mm -hmm. know. And just like cleaning and cleaning throughout the process, you, you do those type of things, you're going to be so much better on the uh, as you go and mm -hmm. to the other end. It's going to be a pleasure to work and a pleasure to be in that environment. And Instead of fighting through and struggling <laughs> through, through the day, right. you know. So I just really say, just the big thing is to analyze what your needs are and see what kind of way, what kind of things you need to uh, to correct that or keep it in the consistency or improve upon that. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, one of one of my favorite questions to ask, especially someone like yourself. You've been around the block a few times, despite being under the age of 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I just threw myself <laughs> off. But, but the idea of, you were, you've worked in a lot of places, you've seen a lot of things, what would you go back and tell yourself you know, 15 years ago, mm. or whenever you jumped into yeah. the industry? What right? Yeah. What things so you it start, yourself? Yeah, it started about 18, 19 years mm -hmm. ago, and um, I think the thing I wish I was more patient. I mean, I think I was so determined yeah. that sometimes, you know, looking back, 
I wish I could have told myself you will, you know, you will get to where you're wanting to go, and then not to relax or take off the intensity, but maybe then to have less less worry and things like that. I mean, I definitely was very, have always been very motivated and very focused on what I want to do, and my dream was always to actually to do what I'm doing today, and um, I, it was worth the wait, and it was worth everything I w went through to get here, and there was a lot of sacrifice, and like we all have, but a lot of. Uh, Hard work and sacrifice, and that makes it that much sweeter, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I'm, I don't have a lot of like regrets or anything, or too many things. I would, many things I would change differently. I mean, I think the main thing is to be, a, you know, as a young man, to be to be more patient and more understanding. Uh, look a little bit further into the future instead of so much in the moment. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we get frustrated that that you know well. And I see the frustration in cooks, young cooks and stuff. Well, I've lined a thousand tarts and I'm lining them again today and I'm doing a great job of it. And sometimes we'll, we want to move on to the next thing too quick. Mm. Put the time in and uh, put, you never mastering it in that short amount of time, a thousand to nothing. You know, put the time in, really master your craft, really think of the details use your senses, all your senses, mm -hmm. appreciate everything when you're cooking. You're a young pastry chef, pastry person, you know, old or young, you should be tasting the whole time, not mm -hmm. just this is the recipe, this is what we do, and it be a robotic kind of thing. Um, but really use your senses and feel and appreciate and understand what you're doing, you know, and be in tune with the product. That's, I think, a shortcut to mastering something. Just being aware and being engaged mm. with the product, you know, like you would a person. Like it's a relationship yeah. with that product and really understand and know it and put the time and effort into know it. Mm. You know, work with it in the way that you're engaged with it. And uh, I think that is something I learned and it took myself time to learn in uh, self-discipline. Um, that I, I feel like I've instilled a lot of self-discipline in myself uh, throughout the years and everything and, and to to uh, you know, understand about how flavors work, how how the texture works, about the but respecting the technology mm -hmm. and the uh, formulation of, of ingredients and everything. But I just think, just you know, take time, be patient. If you put in the work, you put in all the time, all the work. Really study your craft, mm -hmm. be engaged with the product. You're gonna get there. No, you know, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. But the destination, you're gonna get to the destination. Don't, don't worry about other people, what they're doing. You need to work about yourself and what you're doing, you know? I, I like to work with blinders on a little bit. I'm not trying to, I don't really keep, worry too much about what somebody else is doing or think too much about that. I'm very happy that we have such a diverse industry and everybody mm -hmm. has really interesting things they do, but I've always been uh, the kind of person I always want to do, be creative and think of my own way to do things or, or um, my own style and things. And, and I think that that's fun too, like, yeah. I mean, not advice to my younger self, but advice to young people to really, uh, you know, there's not going to be a better trainer beside yourself. And, you know, listen to your heart. Find, you know, be dedicated to your craft and listen to the people above you because they've experienced it, you know, and they've been through it. But at the same time, follow your dreams, listen to your heart. You know, you're going to do, you know, I had so many people tell me not to do this. Why would you do this? You know, all the risk it takes and uh, through a lot of things I've done in my career, and my heart said yes. My, my, my mind didn't always even say yes, but my heart said yes, and I did. And I'm ha yeah. so happy for those moments in my career. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I can put it, anything else on top of that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's a great way to sum up everything and, and the advice for a lot of young cooks and, and obviously speaking to yourself and a bunch of other people that are out there that want to pursue something. I think it boils down to you know, listening to yourself and what you want um, and just going and executing of it and you're a perfect example of that and I think you know, if there's anyone who could lead the way and, and take on you know, people, here at, people here at the shop and help guide them or you know, in different parts of the country and teach. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your time, Pastry yeah. Elite's time being yeah. here at the bakery today, and uh, very thankful for everything you're doing in uh, in our our. Uh,
industry, really putting a platform together for people around the world to share their work. And uh, I can't say how important that is. I think in the past, you know, I mean, especially with Instagram, uh, being able to show off what we all do around the world and in such a real time kind of way, and it's brought it to the public in such a way that people are, I saw this on TV or I saw this, look at these glazed cakes, and it makes it relative to, instead of like, what is that? They're like, oh, I've seen that. But I love that. Like, I'm so happy you do that, you know? So thank you for sharing all the passion everybody puts in and through your own your own form and your own passion. And I, I can say for, on behalf of a lot of chefs, it's very appreciated and a lot of clients out there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Take care, guys. Thank you. All right.